Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for all of these promises that we read in the scripture. We thank you that you have poured out your love on us in such a powerful way that we can read about it and think about it. So I ask that you would open us up, open our hearts up to these mysteries that are no longer a mystery, that have been revealed to us in Christ. Holy Spirit, help us to see what you would have us to see this morning. In the time that we have, help us to respond to you. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, hopefully you're already in Ephesians chapter 1, looking at verse 3. I want to give you a little bit of information about myself that most of you have probably already figured out. Uh, and that is that uh, I, I'm a little bit of a nerd, and um, not a little bit, but like a lot. Like, I enjoy studying, I enjoy reading, it weirds people out. Um, when, I gra- when I finished my doctorate, Elise said, you should, you should read some, some fiction. Like, you've just been reading nonfiction for years. And I said, yeah, I know. I've been really wanting to read Henry V, Shakespeare's play. And she said, that's not what I was talking about. And I said, well, that's what I would want to do. And so I'm a, a nerd and growing up in the church, there was always this disconnect for me, just as part of my story, is that felt called to ministry, went off to college, started studying, and I thought I would be learning to preach, and I certainly did learn a lot of things to help me along the way, but I really enjoyed learning theology and history and languages and all of these other parts of the, the Bible, the academic study of the Word, that other people didn't enjoy. And I found that the more I learned about those areas... And the more I went to church then in response and had all of this information in my head that I didn't know what to do with, that I, sorry, geez, that I was kind of being pushed into the corner. It was kind of just like, hey, you, that's great. That's awesome that you're studying all that theology stuff. And that's great that you love it. That's for you. That's not for everybody else. So you just keep that in your head and you, that's your little hobby. And, but you go over there, and, and we'll just do ministry together without it. And I often got frustrated. And in fact, one of the things in conversations with people that they ask me, well, what, what is it about your kind of academic experience background that you want to bring to the church? My response is always, I want there to be a place for people that love to study theology in that way. But the second response is, I want people who do not love to study theology in that way. If it's just not your favorite hobby to sit down and read a book on ancient Mesopotamia, that's normal is what it is. It's normal, but we still want you to understand that theology is for you. And that's where we start in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It's, it's the reason why I wanted to include this message in our series on the local church. It's to address the fact that this local body, and in fact every local body that gathers, is not just a group of people that gather as a social club, but a group of people that gather around a message. And theology is the study. It's using your brain, your mind that God has given you to ask, what exactly is that message? And who exactly is this God that we serve? And Paul, in laying out this rich Theology in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, I mean, it's just packed full of terms that impact the way that we talk about God. And as Paul does that, he's got a central message that is more than just big theological language. Yes, there is a text full of truths about who God is, but he's got a message, a big idea that stretches beyond that. So I want to explore it starting in verse 3. Paul uses or or develops this big idea using a Jewish prayer of blessing. It's called a barakah. You might want to say that to yourself. Barakah. You don't have to put the phlegm on it, but just that's what it's called. It's a Jewish uh, prayer of blessing that they would recite in their synagogues or at the temple as they're going in. It's a religious uh, kind of reading of praise that they would go into their synagogues, into their temple, and they would praise God, and specifically, they would praise God for what God has done in their lives and in the world around them. 
So that's how Paul starts, verse 3. He said, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. So this is an act of praise, an act of worship, where Paul praises God and he blesses God. That's the language that's important. He is blessing God because of the way that God has blessed us, believers. So God blesses believers with an inheritance. In fact, and I'm going to take a sidebar, Paul is going to use some terms to describe the spiritual blessing that we have in Christ, the salvation that we have, this inheritance that we've all been saved by his blood. And he's going to use some terms that for some of you are bad words, or at the very least, words that make you uncomfortable, words that you would not bring up in Sunday school class, words like predestined, choose, adoption. And I'm going to tell you right now, as your pastor, I'm not a coward, but that's not the point of this whole passage, and it's not the point of this message. So you are free. This is your invitation. You can come up to me at any point and say, Pastor, what do you think about those words? But I just don't have time to explain what I think those words mean in this context and get you to lunch. I don't have time for that. So here's your invitation. If you want to ask, you can ask. But the goal of all of these words that Paul lists, I mean, look at these promises. He, Paul is just laying it on here. Promise after promise for 10 verses. He chose us in Christ. That's God the Father chose us to be his disciples in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. That he has not just saved us from our sins, but called us and equipped us to be holy, to live righteous, morally upright lives. He has predestined us to be adopted. So we're no longer outside the family. We are now inside the family. We can say we are a part of this. We are chosen and loved by him through Jesus Christ. And he did all of this. And this is Paul's big idea that he is developing here. According to to the good pleasure of his will. Paul's saying God did all of this in saving you, in saving me, in revealing to us all of these big theological truths about who Christ is. He did all of this according to his pleasure. That it gave the Father joy. I want you to think about this. It gave God who created the universe joy to save you through faith in Christ. It brings him pleasure and enjoyment and contentment and satisfaction to see that you are following after Jesus with the end result, the end of verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. What brings God the Father pleasure? The God that created planets and solar systems that you and I, even with the most advanced telescopes, can't see? It's that a gathered people meets regularly and praises his name because they are satisfied in him. It's that regular believers are thinking about who God is, loving him, learning more about him, following him, and then in response are crying out to him in worship. This is the big idea that Paul's developing. It's that good theology is good worship. See, we are a church that cares a great deal about worship. Some of you have told me that. And the transition, it's, but it's obvious, even if you just look, I mean, it's built into our sanctuary. We've got a row of pews on this side that stops halfway down because we have people that play instruments every day as an expression, or every Sunday as an expression of worship. It's built into our identity that we care about it. But I want you to not miss this, that the music itself is not the point. The point is the deeper truths that we are expressing when we sing songs and play music together. It is the truths about God that we cry out to one another, not to the stage, but even to one another saying, get this, make sure that you get this truth about who God is every single week. That's the point. And these truths about who God is, this, this deep theology that God wants each and every one of us to develop, not just nerds, not just people who do it as a hobby, but every single human, those truths are supposed to lead us to him in deeper acts of worship and not away from him. Let me, let me explain what, I, what I'm trying to say here. I was talking with my friend Andrew, sits up front every week, and uh, some of you know Andrew. Andrew's from London. 
And we're talking about sports because we like to talk about sports. And Andrew said, listen, I've gotten all of the American sports down except for baseball because I've tried and the rules are just too complicated. And I will admit baseball is really complicated. And I said the same thing back to him. I said, listen, I've tried to watch European sports and I've gotten most of it, but I can't understand cricket. It just makes no sense to me. He said, well, I understand cricket. That's not the problem, right? So we got two guys watching two different sports And one of us says we understand and love one sport, and one of us says we understand and love another sport. And when both of us try to watch either other sports, it just... (laughs) See, that's how many of us treat the theological study of God's word, figuring out who God is. We we hear words like holy and blameless, blameless and sanctification and trinity, and we think, boy... That just those words just immediately make my head spin. So you know what? That's for you, and I'm just gonna go over here and try and follow Jesus in my own way, and you do it your own way. And so theology then becomes a hobby, not a discipline that every believer is called to participate in. To think deeply, to use your mind to address the question of who God is. And here's Here's the problem. Here's why theology is not just a hobby. Here's why theology for you as an individual is not an option. Because if you abandon theology altogether, or if, if you even worse, get theology wrong, you will get who God is wrong. All right, like, let, let me go back to Andrew. I told Andrew, I said, you're going to be in the sermon twice, so just get ready. So we'll see. Imagine... If I approach someone that knows Andrew, we're mutual friends, right? I'm over at his house. He's having a party. He's got a coworker there, and we talk about, oh, you know Andrew, and how do you know him? Oh, because you work at the school, and okay, I go to church with Andrew, and uh, that's great. And we just talk about how much we love Andrew. Boy, we both just love Andrew. And, uh, and they say, yeah, you know what? I just love listening to his accent. I love listening to him talk, and I think, me too. And then I say, isn't it so crazy that in Oklahoma City, we can know somebody from Australia? Isn't that great? They say, well, you either don't know the difference between the two accents, which probably isn't that big of a deal, or even worse, you don't actually know Andrew that well. Like a huge part of who he is is that he's from London, and you've gotten that wrong. (laughs) Same is true of our walk with the Lord, is that when we abandon theology and say, that's for somebody else, not me, what we're saying is we love God but we don't love him enough to get key important characteristics about who he is right. We love him enough to just sort of get him right, to just have this kind of baseline view, and then we'll let the pastor or the deacons or the Sunday school leaders, we'll let them do theology, but not not me. It's not really important that I understand God that much. That's for somebody else. The catastrophic thing is not just that you would get God wrong, although that's catastrophic enough. It's also that what you believe about God impacts how you view yourself and how you view the world around you. So now you've not just gotten God wrong, but you don't know who you are, and you don't know who the people around you are. So I want you to think through those categories as we look at Ephesians 1. I want you to think through what it says about God, what it says about you, what it says about others. First, what it says about God, it's that God is always, when we study theology, God is always going to be far bigger than we can understand. Always. Three, there's kind of three sections, and in my Bible it's organized this way into paragraphs. You've got three through six, uh, seven through ten, and then eleven through fourteen, and in all three of these passages you're going to say the same phrase repeated, that God accomplishes everything according to his will. That phrase, according to his will. You also see the phrase already that we've looked at, according to his good pleasure. That God is not in heaven setting the course of the world and then letting it go like a watch, which is what some people actually believe about God. That God kind of sets all the systems up, and then you humans, you just go and do whatever you want. No, it's that God is intimately and meticulously constructing human history so that people would see him so that people would know who he is, so that people would look to his son lifted up on a cross and say, that's our savior. That's what God is doing. This God is doing it throughout all of human history, and he's doing it not just as, not just as a single being, but as a God that we worship in Trinity, 
That's the amazing thing about Ephesians 1 as well, is that everything that Paul says, he says it in reference to all three persons of the Trinity. That here's what the Father's doing. The Father's orchestrating all of this to his good pleasure, and he's doing it in who? In Christ. That's the Son. And he does all of this so that he would seal us with the Holy Spirit. As we read through, we think, man, this mystery, this thing, this truth that God is getting me to see here is far bigger than I can understand. That just when I think I understand who God is, God is suddenly bringing me to a more fuller nuance of his character so that I'm seeing more of him as he actually is. Not the God I want, not the God that my friends tell me exist, not the God that I hear about on TV, maybe not even the God that my parents told me about, but the God that is here. The God that is revealing himself to you right here today through his word. That God is far bigger than we can think or imagine. Now let's think about what God teaches us about ourselves, or what theology teaches us about ourselves. Second thing, theology teaches us to be recipients of grace. You see, all of these words that Paul uses, whether it's predestination or choosing or adoption uh, or, or sealing us to the Holy Spirit, it all kind of revolves around the truth that God tells us in verse 7. Paul says this, in him we have redemption through his blood. What is redemption? Redemption is buying something back that it's lost. And specifically, Paul explains how it is that we are redeemed. We are redeemed through, in verse 7, the forgiveness of our trespasses or our sins. That we have been saved and bought back and redeemed to an eternal relationship with the God that created us by him taking our punishment on the cross to forgive us for our sins. And that, that grace, that moment that you realize that this God is far bigger than you can imagine, that there's nothing that you could do to earn his favor, but that everything that you have in him is an act of grace by him forgiving you from your sins and saving you, that is not just a one-time event. I want you to pay attention to the word that Paul uses in verse 8, because Paul says that that grace is richly poured out on us. Or some of you may have Bible translations that use the word lavish, which I really love that word choice. It's something that God lavishes on us. It means that grace is not a one-time affair. It is not God merely wiping the slate clean and then saying, well, you know what? I've done the best that I can. I've forgiven you for that addiction. I've forgiven you from that sin that you committed towards that other person the other day. I've forgiven you from that bitterness, from that anger. I've done all that. Now ball's in your court. No, but that God lavishes his grace on us, that grace is an everyday act. Last week I went to a restaurant downtown, and I did what I'm always nervous to do at a nicer restaurant, which is order a chicken fried steak, because chicken fried steak is kind of the same if you get it at a nice restaurant or at, like, Chili's. It doesn't matter. Um, it's It's just what it is. And they had jalapeno gravy, and I thought, well, maybe. Oof, that sounds good. But I really want to see, like, what's the volume of the gravy? What's the ratio here? And let me tell you, they lavished it on. I mean, it was just chicken fried steak and a soup of jalapeno gravy, which is what I signed up for. Um, don't tell me about the nutrition. Just, I'm just telling you that's what I signed up for. <laughs> that's what Christ does for us in our weaknesses in everything in our life that doesn't make sense, in every bit of hurt and anger and bitterness and sin, God lavishes grace on us so that we can say everything that we are as a disciple, not just the moment that we trusted in him for the first time, not just our salvation experience, but everything we have is an act of grace, which means that all we are, is re- are we're just recipients of that grace. We are just people as we gather together as the church every week, that acknowledge we need this God far more than we can communicate or understand. And if that's true about us, that all we are are recipients of grace, people in need of his grace, well, theology then teaches us to see other people in that way, teaches us to see other human beings around us as people in need of his grace. In fact, Paul's going to go on, and again, like I said, he is just stacking on word after word that he can try and explain what it is that God has done in saving us. 
And in verse 11 through 14, you're going to see some of the same words show up. Words like predestined, inheritance, uh, the plan that God is putting out. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit, our salvation, the moment that we believe, the word of truth, all of the things that God has given us. But I want you to pay attention in verse 11. And I really love how Brother Phil's translation brought this out to the we language and the you language. Because normally in Paul's letters, we means all believers. All believers can say whatever Paul's saying when he says we, but not here. Here, Paul creates a contrast between we and you. So the question is, who is the we that Paul's talking about and who is the you? It seems obvious that Paul's, the you is talking to the church in Ephesus, the church that the book of Ephesians was written to, but it's even deeper than that. It's the fact that in Ephesus, they were dealing with this divide between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. And there was this tendency for Jewish Christians to see Gentile Christians as less than, as not quite as redeemed, not quite as saved. In the family, but just barely. That was the way they viewed one another. And Paul here uses this we and you language to make it clear that there's no distinction distinction all of the things that paul can say about we as jewish believers in his day he's saying we jews who already believed who already heard the gospel who are the first fruits of what god is doing in this church we jews have the exact same inheritance as you gentiles and you meaning you in this body may not see other people along those lines because we don't have a jewish gentile divide like they did, but I guarantee you, you still see people in the same way that Jews view Gentiles in the church, in your own heart. Because I do it. I, I have a tendency to say, well, yeah, that person believes in Jesus, but I mean, they're not really following him fully. Yeah, that person believes in Jesus, but they've gotten a lot wrong in their theology. Let me tell you about it. They're just way out here. And Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has been redeemed, we are in, all of us. There, there is not one of you who is more in than the person next to you. There is not one of you who is more in need of Jesus' grace than the person next to you. There is not one of you who has it more figured out than the person next to you. The moment that you have it figured out is the moment that you realize you don't have it figured out, but that you have met and encountered the God that knows everything and has done all of this to save you and the person next to you. So that because we realize that we are undeserving of God's grace, we then realize that the person next to us is deserving of our grace. That's the irony. We were undeserving, and because God saved someone like me who was so undeserving and so broken, that means that I have an obligation to show grace to the person next to me that absolutely drives me crazy. I have an obligation to show grace to the person that has said things to hurt me. I have an obligation to show grace to the person that I know has been talking behind my back. I have an obligation to do all of that, to be a recipient of grace and to see others as individuals who are in need of grace. Theology does all of that, and it completely changes our world. As we begin to view God properly, ourselves properly, and others properly, those theological truths will always run counter to our heart's inclination. Our heart's inclination is either to see ourselves as individuals who have it all figured out or as individuals who are totally unworthy of whatever God wants to do with us. And God says both of those are wrong. Both of those are wrong. I love you so much to show you that you need me and that if you will trust in me, you will be fully in the family. Not halfway in, not partway in, fully in a full recipient of every heavenly blessing that I have for you. That's how much I love you and care about you. And that's how much I love and care about your neighbor who you might think is undeserving of my salvation or who you might think will never get it figured out. That's how much I love them. That's world shattering. It demands that we begin to think deeper about who God is and what God does in our lives. And when we see these ideas in concert together, we see that theology is something that we need, but never something that we can do alone. In fact, there's a moment in the Gospels where Jesus gets into a conversation with a woman 
that turns into a theological debate. Some of you have read it before, but if you haven't, we're going to read part of it again this morning. It's the conversation with the woman at the well, a woman with serious sin in her life that's been unrepentant, multiple adulterous relationships, and she maybe tries to skirt the conversation around that to engage in a theological debate with Jesus because she's a Samaritan, and they have different theological views from the Jews, and the Samaritans believe that the temple is on the mountain that's in their country, and the Jews believe that the real temple is in Jerusalem. So she starts to poke and prod Jesus, like, Jesus, where's the real temple? Where am I really supposed to worship at? Why don't you answer that, and then we'll talk about my sin. And this is what Jesus tells her, John 4, verses 22 through 23. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. Now, that sounds like an arrogant statement. Like, you Samaritans, let me tell you, woman at the well, you've got it wrong. I'm going to give you some theological truth here. But even more than that, he's going to show her some grace that's coming. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Meaning, it's not at this point ultimately going to be about what temple you worship, but do you worship the God that created you in truth and in spirit? Spirit meaning being a person that has been truly born again. You've truly had that moment where Jesus has come into your heart and saved you through the power of the spirit, and you now worship in the spirit, not through physical means like they worshiped with back then in the sacrificial system, but you worship the God in spirit. But it is equally important, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, that you worship this God in spirit truth. And I love that Jesus uses the plural there, the true worshipers, meaning you can't be a worshiper of Jesus by yourself. It's going to take all of God's people gathering together to worship him in spirit and in truth. That's where the true temple will lie. And we talked about that last week. The idea that this local body of believers called the church is a temple. It's a group of people that know the Father through the Holy Spirit, and we gather every week to express those theological truths to each other, other, that we do know this God, that we do love him and follow him in truth. That's the call here. That's the call to do theology together, to gather with the church to worship God in truth. And that's good news, because what it means is you don't have to figure it out all on your own. You don't have to figure it out by yourselves while the theology nerds sit in the corner without you. We do it together. We worship God in truth together. We follow the Lord together. And that worshiping God in theological truth doesn't just give us big heads, but it leads to deeper levels of worship and obedience. So think about it in three ways. Three ways that we worship God in truth together as the church and three ways that we do it at first part. Number one, we do it together in our main service. When we sing songs, we don't just pick whatever sounds good on the radio. We sing the songs that communicate the best and most accurate truths about who God is. We make distinct decisions about what kind of songs we will sing and won't sing. Those aren't style decisions, but they're decisions mostly about theological truth. Number two, we do it in small groups. We gather during what most of you grew up calling the Sunday school hour. I've tried to change my language and call it just small groups, but we gather in other people, and that's where those theological truths begin to touch our lives because although you could stand up and ask a question during the sermon, I would hope that you wouldn't, but you can do that in a small group. You can begin to share, like, I don't understand how this affects my daily life, or I want to see that truth come to bear in my life, but I'm just not understanding how that's going to happen. And then number three, we do it in our normal conversations together. We do it in the hallway. We do it in groups of people. We do it one-on-one. We meet for coffee during the week. We get honest with another. We, we begin to be the church together by looking one another in the eye and saying, how are you really doing? What is God really showing you in this season of your life? What does God want to do to stir up your heart to understand him better? And really, that's not any different than study habits that you had in college or high school. You'd go to class, you'd listen to a lecture, you'd hear the content, and then you'd get into study groups, and then you'd study on your own, and then you would study one-on-one with a friend, and they would share their notes, and sometimes they would share their answers, and we won't talk about that, but you would study together. 
right? You would do it, big groups, small groups, all over different conversations during your week so that you could really understand what it is that you were supposed to learn. So let me ask you, how are your theological study habits going? Are you showing up every week and just reading the words on the screen and checking your fantasy lineup while the pastor talks and doing what it is that you need to do to get through here to say you went to church? Or are you participating? Are you thinking about the words that we sing in our songs? Are you thinking about the sermon as it's being preached, taking notes if you need to? Are you plugged into a small group where theology can begin to touch your everyday life and the way that you behave? Are you having those conversations one-on-one with other believers, or are you out the door as soon as you can be? How does your spiritual life stack up this morning as we think about developing good theological study habits, pursuing God's truth for your life right here, right now. I would invite you to think about that this week. Think about what it means for you to follow the Lord, not just with your heart, not just worship the Lord in spirit, but to worship the Lord in truth. But for some of you, the first theological study habit you need is not to get plugged into a small group or to attend church, but to meet Jesus, to learn who Jesus is, to learn what it means to follow Jesus. And I'm going to invite you to do that today. In fact, we're going to have a time in just a second that we call our invitation. It's just going to be one final song. And if for the first time you need to meet Jesus as he truly is, not just Jesus as you thought he was, not just the Jesus that you are hoping for, but the Jesus that truly calls out to you this morning to follow him, I'd invite you to come forward. I'm going to be down here and available to talk. You come forward and have that conversation about what it means for you to follow Jesus. Others of you, there's something that you need to talk through. This is part of our time together, being the church, doing theology together. You come forward. And be honest, the altar's open for prayer, but let's not waste this time to worship the Lord, not just in spirit, but in truth. Let's pray, church.